in the spring of the year 1854 I had undertaken a journey to London, that I might escape from internal disquietude, and devote myself, without interruption, to science. I had letters of introduction to persons of eminence, who were anxious for revelations from the supernatural world. I made the acquaintance of several, and discovered in them, amidst much that was courteous, a depth of indifference or trifling. They asked me forthwith to work wonders, as if I were a charlatan, and I was somewhat discouraged, for, to speak frankly, far from being inclined to initiate others into the mysteries of ceremonial magic, I had myself shrunk all along from its illusions and weariness, moreover, such ceremonies necessitated an equipment which would be expensive and hard to collect. I buried myself, therefore, in the study of the transcendent Kabbalah, and concerned myself no further with English adepts, when, returning one day to my hotel, I found a note awaiting me. This note contained half of a card, divided transversely, on which I immediately recognized the seal of Solomon. It was accompanied by a small sheet of paper, on which these words were penciled, Tomorrow, at three o'clock, in front of Westminster Abbey, the second half of this card will be given you. I kept this curious assignation. At the appointed spot I found a carriage drawn up, and as I held unaffectedly the morsel of card in my hand, a footman approached, making a sign as he did so, and then opened the door of the equipage. It contained a lady in black, wearing a thick veil, she motioned to me to take a seat beside her, showing me at the same time the other half of the card. The door closed, the carriage drove off, and, the lady raising her veil, I saw that my appointment was with an elderly person, with grey eyebrows and black eyes of unusual brilliance, and strangely fixed in expression. Sir she began, with a strongly marked English accent, I am aware that the law of secrecy is rigorous amongst adepts, a friend of Sir B. L., who has seen you, knows that you have been asked for phenomena, and that you have refused to gratify such curiosity. You are possibly without the materials, I should like to show you a complete magical cabinet, but I must exact beforehand the most inviolable silence. If you will not give me this pledge upon your honor, I shall give orders for you to be driven to your home. I made the required promise, and faithfully keep it by divulging neither the name, position, nor abode of this lady, whom I soon recognized as an initiate, not exactly of the first order but still of a most exalted grade. We had a number of long conversations, in the course of which she invariably insisted upon the necessity of practical experience to complete initiation. She showed me a collection of magical vestments and instruments, lent me some rare books, which I needed, in short, she determined me to attempt, at her house, the experiment of a complete evocation, for which I prepared during a period of twenty-one days scrupulously observing the rules laid down in the thirteenth chapter of the ritual. The probation terminated on the 24th of July, it was proposed to evoke the phantom of the divine Apollonius, and to question it upon two secrets, one which concerned myself, and one which interested the lady. She had counted on taking part in the evocation with a trustworthy person, but this person proved nervous at the last moment, and, as the triad or unity is indispensable for magical rites, I was left to my own resources. The cabinet prepared for the evocation was situated in a turret, it contained four concave mirrors, and a species of altar having a white marble top, encircled by a chain of magnetized iron. The sign of the pentagram, as given in the fifth chapter of this work, was carved and gilded on the white marble surface. It was drawn also in various colors upon a new white lambskin stretched beneath the altar. In the middle of the marble table there was a small copper chafing dish, containing charcoal of alder and laurel wood, another chafing dish was set before me on a tripod. I was clothed in a white garment, very similar to the vestments of our Catholic priests, but longer and wider, and I wore upon my head a crown of vervain leaves, intertwined with a golden chain. I held a new sword in one hand, and in the other the eagle. I kindled two fires with the required and prepared substances, and I began reading the evocations of the ritual in a voice at first low, but rising by degrees. The smoke spread, the flame caused the objects upon which it fell to waver, then it went out, 
the smoke still floating white and slow about the marble altar, I seemed to feel a kind of quaking of the earth, my ears tingled, my heart beat quickly. I heaped more twigs and perfumes on the chafing dishes, and as the flame again burst up, I beheld distinctly, before the altar, the figure of a man of more than normal size, which dissolved and vanished away. I recommenced the evocations, and placed myself within a circle which I had drawn previously between the tripod and the altar. Thereupon the mirror which was behind the altar seemed to brighten in its depth, a one form was outlined therein, which increased, and seemed to approach by degrees. Three times, and with closed eyes, I invoked Apollonius. When I again looked forth there was a man in front of me, wrapped from head to foot in a species of shroud, which seemed more grey than white, he was lean, melancholy and beardless, and did not altogether correspond to my preconceived notion of Apollonius. I experienced an abnormally cold sensation, and when I endeavoured to question the phantom I could not articulate a syllable. I therefore placed my hand upon the sign of the pentagram, and pointed the sword at the figure, commanding it mentally to obey and not alarm me, in virtue of the said sign. The form thereupon became vague, and suddenly disappeared. I directed it to return, and presently felt, as it were, a breath close by me. Something touched my hand which was holding the sword, and the arm became immediately benumbed as far as the elbow. I divined that the sword displeased the spirit, and I therefore placed its point downwards, close by me, within the circle. The human figure reappeared immediately, but I experienced such an intense weakness in all my limbs, and a swooning sensation came so quickly over me, that I made two steps to sit down, whereupon I fell into a profound lethargy accompanied by dreams, of which I had only a confused recollection when I came again to myself. For several subsequent days my arm remained benumbed and painful. The apparition did not speak to me, but it seemed that the questions I had designed to ask answered themselves in my mind. To that of the lady an anterior voice replied death. It was concerning a man of whom she desired information. As for myself, I sought to know whether reconciliation and forgiveness were possible between two persons who occupied my thoughts, and the same inexorable echo within me also answered dead. I am stating facts as they occurred, but I would impose faith on no one. The consequence of this experience on myself was something inexplicable. I was no longer the same man, something of another world had passed into me, I was no longer either sad or cheerful but I felt a singular attraction towards death, unaccompanied, however, by any suicidal tendency. I analyzed my experience carefully, and, notwithstanding a lively nervous repugnance, I twice repeated the same experiment, allowing some days to elapse between each, there was not, however, sufficient difference between the phenomena to warrant me in protracting a narrative which is perhaps already too long. But the net result of these two additional evocations was for me the revelation of two Kabbalistic secrets which might change, in a short space of time, the foundations and laws of society at large, if they came to be known generally. Am I to conclude from all this that I really evoked, saw, and touched the great Apollonius of Tuna? I am not so hallucinated as to affirm or so unserious as to believe it. The effect of the probations, the perfumes, the mirrors, the pentacles, is an actual drunkenness of the imagination, which must act powerfully upon a person otherwise nervous and impressionable. I do not explain the physical laws by which I saw and touched, I affirm solely that I did see and that I did touch, that I saw clearly and distinctly, apart from dreaming, and this is sufficient to establish the real efficacy of magical ceremonies. For the rest, I regard the practice as destructive and dangerous, if it became habitual, neither moral nor physical health would be able to withstand it. The elderly lady whom I have mentioned, and of whom I subsequently had reason to complain, was a case in point, despite her assertions to the contrary, I have no doubt that she was addicted to necromancy and goetia. She at times lost all self-control, at others yielded to senseless fits of passion, for which it was difficult to discover a cause. I left London without bidding her adieu, and I shall faithfully adhere to my engagement by giving no clue to her identity, 
which might connect her name with practices, pursued in all probability without the knowledge of her family, which I believe to be large and of very considerable position. There are evocations of intelligence, evocations of love, and evocations of hate, but, once more, there is no proof whatsoever that spirits really leave the higher spheres to communicate with us, the opposite, as a fact, is more probable. We evoke the memories which they have left in the astral light, or common reservoir of universal magnetism. It was in this light that the Emperor Julian once saw the gods manifest, looking old, ill, and decrepit fresh proof of the influence exercised by current and accredited opinions on the reflections of this same magical agent which makes our tables talk and answers by taps on the walls. After the evocation I have described, I reread carefully the life of Apollonius, who is represented by historians as an ideal of antique beauty and elegance, and I then observed that towards the end of his life he was starved and tormented in prison. This circumstance, which may have remained in my memory without my being aware of it, possibly determined the UN attractive form of my vision, which I regard solely as the voluntary dream of a waking man. I have seen two other persons, whom there is no occasion to name, both differing, as regards costume and appearance, from what I had expected. For the rest, I commend the greatest caution to those who propose devoting themselves to similar experiences, their result is intense exhaustion, and frequently a shock sufficient to occasion illness. I must not conclude this chapter without mentioning the curious opinions of certain Kabbalists, who distinguish between apparent and real death, holding that the two are seldom simultaneous. In their idea, the majority of persons who are buried are still alive, while a number of others who are regarded as living are in reality dead. Incurable madness, for example, would be with them an incomplete but real death, leaving the terrestrial body under the purely instinctive control of the sidereal body. When the human soul experiences a greater blow than it can bear, it would thus become separated from the body, leaving the animal soul, or sidereal body, in its place and these human remains would be to some extent less alive really than a mere animal. Dead persons of this kind are said to be recognized by the complete extinction of the moral and affectionate sense, they are neither bad nor good, they are dead. Such beings, who are the poisonous fungi of the human race, absorb the life of living beings to their fullest possible extent, and this is why their proximity benumbs the soul and chills the heart. If such corpse-like creatures really existed, they would realize all that was recounted in former times about brucolax and vampires. Now, are there not certain persons in whose presence one feels less intelligent, less good, sometimes even less honest? Are there not some whose vicinity extinguishes all faith and all enthusiasm, who draw you by your weaknesses, who govern you by your evil propensities? and make you die slowly to morality in a torment like that of Mizantius. These are dead people whom we mistake for living beings, these are vampires whom we regard as friends.